For about the past seven years now, Rupert Soar has been my collaborator on our research on termite uh, mounds and their physiology in northern Namibia. And one of the things that uh, Rupert has helped us on is to characterize the structure of termite mounds in greater detail than it ever has been done before. So Rupert, uh, paint for us a picture of what the inside of a termite mound looks like. The inside of the termite mound is a wondrous thing. From the outside, we're looking at a, a large pile of earth, which doesn't look all that. Um, the idea is you get your X-ray specs on and, and look beneath that surface. So, as you know, what we did was we filled up those mounds with plaster of Paris and we washed them off. And, and what we see is a remarkably complex structure. And uh, what we're seeing essentially in trying to describe that is near the center and, and low down, we get these short, very large channels and uh, ducts that kind of sweep upwards and gradually it's like a, a bonfire almost where lots of uh, smaller longer tubes radiate outwards but lean and converge towards the top and then right at the outside just in that 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 inch or so of skin that uh, defines the surface the skin of the mound thousands you know myriad number of, of tiny little capillaries almost but uh, you know egress channels as they're called but you look at this and, and you believe that you genuinely are looking through the skin of your own body and, and looking at that beautiful complexity of the of the vascular system for example so the structure is uh, reminiscent of uh, physiological organs within our own body is what you're saying well in a way i'd throw that back at you because you know what i'd really like to know is 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 how you come to that i mean for me looking at this structure was looking at that drastically complex solution and wondering how does that work but I remember that you just had that moment of clarity where you just recognized it for what it was I mean what what was that about well um, this is related to your work in, uh, in filling these termite mounds with plaster I remember the the incident vividly we were sitting in our lab in Namibia and uh, we had a, a plaster filled uh, cap of a termite mound with this incredible structure and We'd always known that the termite mound was somehow involved in, in the uh, respiratory gas exchange, acting as a lung for the underground colony. But, uh, but uh, we were looking at this, and the impression was quite vivid uh, as uh, something that looked like an inside-out lung, for example. Right. And, uh, and given what we knew about uh, lung function, that's when the actual uh, mechanism of how the thing worked uh, uh, came to the fore. And, uh, one of the uh, uh, things that, uh, that, 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 that impressed us about that, uh, about that structure is that it works very much like a lung, but lungs work in a very, very different way from uh, the way that uh, people had for long thought a termite mound uh, did. Uh, or indeed uh, a building. Or indeed a building, yes. And, and, uh, and uh, of course, there had been termite-inspired uh, buildings out there, yeah, which, uh, sure. which I hope we'll get to uh, in a little bit. But uh, uh, one of the uh, things that lungs do is that uh, they, they, they act as intermediaries between two environments, one that's inside the body and, uh, and a, a, a messier, uh, less predictable environment outside the body. And somehow a lung has to be structured in a way that mediates an exchange of respiratory gases, oxygen, say, from the outside to the inside. And it does so in some fairly complex ways, and it requires a complex structure to do that. And right. uh, one of the essential features of the termite mound is that it's not a shelter so much, uh, you know, that is a, a, a barrier behind which the termite uh, colony can hide, but it's actually, in its own way, a mediator, like a lung is, between a very steady environment inside the nest and a very messy environment outside the nest. Well, let's just pick up on that and in terms of the relation to the building. It's probably worth asking you then, what is the difference then between how buildings work and what we see in a termite mound or indeed in our own lungs? Uh, one of the design principles that architects have, have brought to uh, 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 termite-inspired buildings, as they're called, is, is an idea that somehow the termite mound uh, uh, helps ventilate the building. And there's a very special definition that has to go with ventilation that implies to bulk flows of air through a building. And architects had, had uh, uh, taken how they thought termite mounds worked uh, and tried to uh, apply them to ventilation, actual bulk movements of air through a nest. Mm. What they failed to realize was that uh, termites uh, dedicate their lives to avoiding that kind of ventilation. Uh, they don't like bulk flows of air, and therefore, uh, uh, in order to be able to carry out 
the physiological function of a termite nest, that is they have to breathe and exchange gases just like we do, uh, they have to have some kind of mediator, structural mediator between that very steady environment inside and uh, as I say the re relatively messy turbulent environment so, outside. So essentially what you're saying is, is, is what we get in nature is, is a non-bulk flow movement of air which is what we do get in our own homes. What's the key advantage then? What is it that you're saying is the key to not having a bulk airflow movement? Uh, one of the things that not having bulk airflow movement through our own houses is, is that it makes for a very comfortable environment. You know, if we uh, if we uh, imagine ourselves sitting in, in, in a room uh, that's too hot, uh, for example, uh, we might want to open the window. Uh, uh, what that does is it opens up a, a, a fairly broad portal to the messy environment <coughs> outside and you get things like gusts of air that mm. blow your papers around mm -hmm. or that make you uncomfortable drafts and those kinds of things. And, and what the termite mound does is it's structured in a way that acts like a window but in a very special way. It helps uh, filter that messy energy outside and uses that to uh, actually perform a function which is managing an internal environment without some of the uncomfortable things that uh, that might go with opening a window for example. So, so you're saying that the kind of messiness of nature is what fundamentally we're not tapping into as architects, designers, and things like that. I think so, actually, you know, because uh, if you look at the way uh, engineers and architects design buildings to, say, capture wind energy to ventilate buildings, so uh, they look to nature sources of energy in nature to drive bulk flows of air through mm. buildings and uh, that leads to drafts and other kinds of things that make people uh, uncomfortable yeah. and uh, the kind of messiness in the environment that termites have learned to exploit so effectively is regarded by uh, many architects and engineers as a kind of nuisance form of energy right. you know it sets up uh, uh, gusts of uh, air uh, unwanted flows of air through buildings it can actually set up resonances in buildings that can actually shake them apart and so forth so Sorry. So the, the killer question then has to be what you're proposing is that we can actually learn from nature and implement systems that use messy ventilation solutions that we find in nature. It's not some of this heresy almost trying to purport the idea that what we see in a termite man could be used in our own homes quite literally as a translation of that system. I'm not sure I'd call it heresy, but I do think it's a radical, radically different way of approaching our way of uh, using wind energy to uh, manage the climates in our own buildings. For example, you know, if, if you if you look at the uh, mindset of the of, of say using a windmill to generate electricity or using a tall building to capture wind to drive bulk flows of, 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 of air through uh, a building, uh, uh, one of the problems that runs into is that those sources of wind energy that are that can be exploited economically uh, for generating electricity from windmills and those sorts of mm -hmm. things, those are very rare. Yeah. But this messy energy that's out there in the environment that termites, again, have learned to exploit so effectively is everywhere. Yes. And they do it by building a structure that uh, manages to tap into that very, very effectively. And if that kind of knowledge of, 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 of the way that termite mounds do this can be applied to our own buildings, this means that any building can be uh, built to exploit uh, this kind of messy wind energy. But in order to do it, you need the kinds of complex structure that enables termite mounts to do this. Would you not say, though, that there is a challenge facing us in terms of translating a, a physical system in which the presence of termites as agents of that change becomes problematic in transferring to a, a dynamic architecture for, for, for which we can use? Well, this I think is the challenge because it uh, it, it uh, forces us to think about buildings in a different way. Uh, we tend to think of buildings as as uh, things, as structures, but uh, what we're really talking about now is imparting a kind of life to buildings. Okay, and uh, that's that's, uh, that's something that uh, is uh, is quite radical in architecture. Uh, are you almost purporting a, a movement back to say a vernacular form of of, of architecture by saying that then as when you talk about the implication of agents within that system? In a sense, yes. And uh, the issue of vernacular architecture and this wisdom that's in, uh, in, uh, in uh, traditional forms of architecture is something that we'll come back to in our next segment. Thank you, Rupert. Mm -hmm.